I'd like to welcome everyone to today's webinar. This is Dr. Marnie Peterson, and I'm the Outreach Coordinator for the Antimicrobial Stewardship Project launched last year by the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy at the University of Minnesota. It's my pleasure to welcome our participants today to the webinar, Infection Prevention and its Role in the Era of Antibiotic Stewardship, with our international expert and advisor, Dr. Trish Pearl. Before she begins her webinar, I'd like to give you a little bit of background about Dr. Pearl. She's a professor of medicine and the chief of infectious diseases at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical School and Medical Center. She is a clinician with an extensive practical and research experience in the field of healthcare associated infections and resistance and epidemiologically significant organisms. And she's recognized globally for innovation and research in the field and the use of research knowledge in the healthcare setting. She's received her medical degree from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. She went on to complete a residency in internal medicine, fellowship in infectious diseases, and, clin and clinical setting. And she was also a professor of medicine and pathology at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine, where she became the senior epidemiologist for the Johns Hopkins Health System. She's the former SHA president and has served on advisory panels for the Institute, National Institutes of Health, World Health Organization, and Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. She continues to be an active researcher and has participated in several studies funded by the CDC and the Veterans Affairs Administration over the years, and she has authored numerous, over 300 peer review articles on this topic. So, Dr. Pearl, I would well, I thank you so much for joining us today, and I'd like to welcome you to our webinar. I would also like to give some instruction to our participants that are just joining us. If you've not already participated in one of our webinars, we do encourage you to submit questions, and that's how you can engage with Dr. Pearl today. You can submit questions via the chat box that's located on your lower right-hand side of the WebEx software. And when you type in your question, you can send your question to all panelists. And Dr. Pro at the end of her webinar will have time to address your questions. So thank you, participants, and thank you, Dr. Pro, for joining us. So good morning or good afternoon to everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, and today we're going to talk a little bit about the uh, synergistic relationship between infection prevention and antimicrobial stewardship. I'd just like to start off with several disclosures. Uh, I have a grant from Metamune that is not related to antimicrobials at all. It's uh, a basic epidemiology. I'm on a couple of advisory boards, and um, I'm also on the SIDRAP advisory board. So my goals this morning or this afternoon are to describe a little bit the roles of infection prevention and antimicrobial stewardship I've really chosen to focus on resistance um, as I think that highlights this dual and symbiotic relationship. I'd like to argue that we cannot forget infection prevention and perhaps that, that our uh, <clears throat> approach to these organisms should even expand further um, given all of the interest in stewardship. So first of all, I need to um, just make a couple of introductory comments about why we need to do something. Many of you already know this, but especially currently we're seeing not only a prevalence, but even the emergence of increasingly multi-drug resistant, both gram negative and gram positive um, organisms, including actually fungi and viruses. These are increasing worldwide. They are associated with considerable morbidity and mortality. We have very few antibiotics in our armamentarium and even fewer in development to treat these infections. And we are um, saddled with uh, some very significant toxicities with the drugs that we are being forced to be used. We are also seeing vulnerable patients who are in, at risk um, and finally, not only are these costly to patients, but they're extremely costly to the healthcare system in general. Uh, 
So this is a, a cartoon, if you will, from um, a website that really looks at some of the emerging uh, problems worldwide um, that we are currently experiencing, Anywhere, anything from emerging uh, gram-positive organisms as well as gram-negative organisms. You can see that certainly there are some areas such as in Asia where there's tremendous resistance that has emerged not only with uh, bacteria but also with uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis. So this is a worldwide problem. And in fact, um, <clears throat> from these, the same website that where uh, the disease of dynamic economics and policy, what you can see is that for some of these organisms, particularly many of the gram negatives, um, the enterococci, uh, that we see a tremendous amount of resistance with still emerging problems in Staph aureus as well as Streptomonia. And this resistance is um, increasing. Uh, here are data from one study that just look at one organism, Acinetobacter baumani, and you can see that since 1999, there was a significant increase in resistance to multiple different antibiotics. And in fact, the CDC estimates that um, there are om almost 2 million Americans that are affected by um, organisms or infections related to antimicrobial resistant organisms, and that uh, 23,000 of these lead to death. There are also um, other causes of morbidity, such as the development of C. difficile as a result of treatment. Um, and in fact, resistance in itself is associated with increased morbidity and mortality. This is a summary of some of the studies that are out there that have looked primarily at gram negatives, although I could show you a similar slide with uh, Staph aureus. And what we know about this is resistance in itself is associated with increased mortality. So we should respect these organisms significantly. And then finally, just some data from a recent study that looked at costs associated to several resistant organisms. And these are excessive costs where they've compared resistant to susceptible strains. And you can see that um, there is a wide range, but that some of these organ infections are uh, clearly associated with um, very significant costs. So, you know, how do we think about this and what is the issue? So this is a very, very simple uh, uh, cartoon, if you will, that was developed by uh, Sylvain Delille. And what you can see here is that you have two primary drivers of resistance. The one driver is transmission, and the second driver is emergence. And we, um, what I'd like to sort of argue is that it really requires this dual control, if you will, to try and abort the emergence of um, and transmission of resistant organisms. And so from this very simple cartoon, what you can see um, is that you know, clearly there are mechanisms in place that we try, um, including hand hygiene and isolation to inhibit transmission. Uh, we decontaminate or clean the environment. We have health policy to impact um, the use of antimicrobials in animals. And then on the uh, <clears throat> left side of your screen, what you'll see is that we really can't affect a lot of the genetic transfers, although there is some emerging data suggesting we can do that. But there's also um, this important role of stewardship in exposure. And so today what I'm going to try and do is, is, again, as I said earlier, really argue that you need both. You cannot do one without the other. And, and these are simple kinds of measures that we have we currently have in our toolbox to um, prevent transmission and the infection prevention toolbox, as you all know, we have hand hygiene, isolation and the use of barrier precautions. We can um, separate patients and separate the environment. We use surveillance. 
We use things like CHD bathing, um, uh, control of the environment, um, and other potential surfaces, vaccination, and then we have stewardship. So how and what is driving a lot of this? This is just a very simple um, cartoon or, or graph that looks at antimicrobial use. What you can see is that the United States is you know, over on the heavy side of antimicrobial use, um, with France leading the pack and the Netherlands being the the least uh, <clears throat> um, using the least number of daily doses uh, per inhabitant. But resistance, as I've said, is driven by several things, and this is an old study, but I really like it. Um, because it shows you how these two different worlds actually really are intersecting. And this is looking at uh, Pseudomonas ruginosa, Asmenobacter balmane, and MRSA. Um, the Pseudomonas is the, the coolish gray color, the yellow is the Asmenobacter, and MRSA is shown in orange. And what you can see in a given patient or in these series of patients is that no emer resistance emerged if you were in the ICU for less than seven days and you did not receive antibiotics. If you were in the ICU less than seven days but you did receive antibiotics, you can see that up to 30% of the pseudomonas was resistant, about 20% of acinetobacter was resistant, and uh, about 5% of the Staph aureus became resistant to methicillin. Um, if you go over to the next panel, what you see is being in the ICU with no antibiotics, you have a lesser emergence of resistance. And then finally, when you're in that environment and you add in antibiotics, you have um, the most pronounced development of resistance. And so these are some of the data that really um, suggest that you need to tackle this both ways. Uh, and so if you look at a cartoon, this is an example developed by Anthony Harris and published in 2006, and there are other, uh, other examples of this. You can see that um, on your left you have a population of patients that are not infected with antimicrobial resistant organisms, they become colonized and then infected, and then you have a subpopulation that develops the resistant organisms. And the drivers of these are not only individual factors, which include resistance, but facility factors, which are primarily the things we associate with infection prevention. So I'm going to talk both about gram-positives and gram-negatives. Um, these are some examples of some of the gram-positives that have become increasingly resistant. And we're going to primarily talk about MRSA and VRE in this context. Um, what you can see in this slide is um, the prevalence or the percentage of resistant isolates worldwide with Romania on your far right um, and then Iceland on the far left. And then you can see some data with um, sort of coloration of the prevalence in various parts of the world. Uh, of note, the white means there's no data, not that it's not there. And the purple is the highest prevalence with red um, and uh, <coughs> being the second highest prevalence. And what's fascinating about this is the sort of variation, if you will, um, even looking at Northern Europe versus um, Southern Europe, looking at Canada versus the United States, looking at parts of South America, um, and making those comparisons. Now, there are some other interesting things that you can look at. Um, here is an example of what happened in Denmark. This is a uh, natural experiment that occurred in the 1960s and 70s where they saw the emergence of MRSA and they actually put in place very aggressive antimicrobial stewardship um, and um, <clears throat> whereas in the United States we did not and we saw an increasing prevalence of MRSA. Um, and if we look at this theme of do antimicrobials drive resistance, here's another example. 
where you can see on your um, on your y-axis the percent susceptibility, and then on your um, x-axis you see your um, DDDs per month. And as you're giving more drug, you see your susceptibility going down. And similarly, on this next slide, what we see is a very interesting natural experiment and data from Europe where um, they actually looked at MRSA in addition to other staphylococcus infections. And what they did was compare their MRSA, which is shown by the darker line, with um, the sum of the lag used of outpatient antimicrobials. And those outpatient antimicrobials were macrolides, third generation cephalosporin, and quinolone consumption. And this isn't proof, but it's certainly an association that you see between the increase in MRSA and outpatient use. And then finally, um, here are data that were published uh, almost uh, uh, 20 years ago that look at fluoroquinolone use with the resistance, um, with resistant rates in um, gram negatives. And so my point really is that we can pick our bugs, but we can really show that uh, the use of antimicrobials drives resistance. But the flip side is very interesting. And here's what I call the War of the Roses, where we've had different strategies taken by two countries. England and France, and they've looked at the incidence of MRSA in um, hospitalized patients. And in both countries, we've seen a decrease. And so can we deconstruct what happened? Well, um, at the same time this was going on, DDAPK was doing, um, was really promoting the use of hand hygiene. And here are some of his early data where he looked at the MRSA incidence in his hospital in Geneva, Switzerland, and new MRSA um, per um, 100 admissions. And what you can see is that both MRSA as well as their nosocomial infections went down. And this cor cor correlates with the implementation of a hand hygiene campaign that occurred um, in the um, at the beginning of uh, the this graph. Now the French actually took that to a new level, and they implemented an MRSA control program in all of their all of their intensive care units across the country. And you can see by the arrow where that um, began. And what this particular slide shows is the difference in the predicted MRSA incidence versus what was observed. And so as they implemented and rolled out this alcohol-based hand hygiene campaign, they saw a significant decrease in um, healthcare-associated MRSA in intensive care units. Uh, now, this is complicated, and it's complicated for a couple of reasons, but let me digress a couple minutes and just show you that um, we actually know that a lot of these bugs have a predilection for the environment, and how much of a predilection depends on a lot of different things. This gives you uh, some examples of Staph aureus, BRE, gram-negative bacilli, and um, C. difficile, and you can see that it is present in occupied as well as cleaned rooms. And in fact, what we see, here's another study, and there are a myriad of others with other organisms out in the literature. I just picked a VRE one. But what you can see is that um, many, many objects in these rooms where these patients live get contaminated. And hence it is this um, these kind of data that really drove the French, as well as Dr. Piquet, to really focus on the use of hand hygiene as a significant prevention strategy. These are probably some of the most compelling data out there. This is a study done by Hardy et al. And um, if you look on the left side of your slide, you see um, three bars that represent three separate patients. Um, and the um, far left represents uh, a date with 
a certain event, the top two bars are looking at environmental contamination. If you follow along towards the right, you can see the dates the patients were admitted. And then if you continue further to the right, you can actually see where all three of these patients actually acquired MRSA. They did molecular typing and, and demonstrated that the patient strain was the same as the environmental strain. Um, and we do also have some other associations. We can look at different organisms and different um, studies to look at the likelihood of a patient acquiring a healthcare-associated infection or a resistant organism based on the type of patient that was in that room beforehand. So if you've been in a room with VRE, for example, um, and it was cultured in that room, you're 2.6-fold more likely to acquire VRE. Now, the other thing that's important is that there are additional, um, based on these data, additional strategies in the sort of infection prevention uh, tool case, if you will, that have been shown to actually be uh, relatively effective. And this particular slide summarizes um, two studies. One was done at Hopkins by Arjun Trinivasan and uh, myself. Where, and what we essentially showed that 21% of patients at risk acquired VRE when we were using gown and gloves versus 42% when we just used gloves alone. Um, and similarly at Wash U, Linda Mundy um, and her team did a very interesting before and after experiment, and that's what's shown in the panel. And you can see the patient days of VRE exposure, the number of acquisitions by the dotted line when they were using gowns, when they were not using gowns, and you can see the significant increase. And then what's nice in this study is they then put the gowns back in place, and you can see, again, a decrease. And so the VRE acquisition in both of these studies was decreased when we implemented a, a barrier of sorts. Um, and that is clearly something that we have um, shown in other settings. And in fact, here is another study that um, is very, very interesting that has looked that look primarily at monoclonal, meaning a single strain, suggesting transmission, in two different hospitals. And what you can see is that the vancomycin usage in both these hospitals was approximately the same, yet their VRE bacteremias were very different. Um, and this was really attributed to some of the infection prevention strategies and including surveillance that were used. Uh, and then finally, um, here is a sort of a summary slide from Jane et al.'s article that was in the New England Journal in 2011. This was a nationwide study looking at healthcare-associated um, MRSA infections where they employed um, a lot of infection prevention strategies, but also there was certainly some culture change with the utilization of positive deviance. And what you see here is, again, a decrease in MRSA in ICUs as well as in non-ICU settings. Um, however, the study is, a, or the, the situation is a little bit more complicated. So I've shown you the French. And I've said there was a war of war of uh, the War of the Roses. I've tried to show you some of the infection prevention data. Um, and now I'd like to show you some of the efforts at the UK. And what you can see is the UK also has um, had a significant decrease in their MRSA. And the toolbox used in the UK is a little bit more complicated in that it not only included infection prevention, but it also included um, public reporting as well as um, 
alternate um, antibiotic management strategies. So here you have a country that has used both strategies and attained a significant decrease. So let's sort of switch our focus to gram negatives. Is it just you know, do we have these data that suggest you need both both stewardship and infection prevention in um, gram positives? So here are a list of some of our favorite actors, if you will, um, that have been important in um, gram gram negative resistance. I know that all of us would probably add on Enterobacter and other organisms that have become particularly problematic. And what can we say about these? Well, first of all, here is a particular study looking at um, just the prevalence of ESBLs. You can see there's a wide variation depending on the part of the world. Um, and that variation depends on, uh, it, it, it's variable in different organisms. Certainly Klebsiella seems to be the winner in this arena. But when we start thinking about these cases and what, what are some of the risk factors, it becomes very, very complicated. Um, and you could argue this is true with gram positives also. Uh, and I just show this slide to show how complicated it can be. And this is, um, this was actually a very interesting, um, set of different, um, studies where they looked at colonization patterns of ESBLs in populations we might not expect it in. And for example, the CTXM, which is one of the enzymes that um, causes um, uh, beta-lactamase production, was found in 22% of people who came in with just acute gastritis and 70%, uh, excuse me, 7% of elderly Chinese. Um, similarly, if you look on the right, what you can see is that, um, again, in a, nor in a population of patients that would not have been expected to have um, these gram negatives, that there was a wide variation uh, in that population. And these, um, and these beta-lactamases, again, have a global reach. Um, there are many, many of them. There are over two or 300 of these. Um, what beta-lactamase is most prevalent does have some ge geographic distribution, but there are also some interesting things that we're learning about these organisms, including they are not only driven by the use of antibiotics, but also by infection prevention practices. Uh, we also need to talk about carbapenemases in this setting, which um, uh, are ESBL-producing bacteria that have increased resistance to carbapenem. And um, <clears throat> what's mostly important about this is that these have emerged in um, certain areas and increased dramatically with widespread uh, uh, distribution across Europe as well as in the United States. Um, and this slide is a little bit old. The percentage of resistance in the United States is much higher at this point. Um, now, when you think about these carbapenemase producing Enterobacter aceae, here is a slide it really looks um, at a couple of things. So not only do we see an increase, but what I wanted to highlight is that some of these are associated with outbreaks. So it's not only emerging, but there does seem to be, at least from outbreak data, evidence of transmission. Um, these are also increasing in um, in prevalence, and here is a slide um, from the European surveillance system, and what you can see is the increase in carbapenemase produced uh, resistant pseudomonas, Klebsiella pneumoniae, as well as multi-drug resistant Klebsiella. And these are globe trotting. Um, this is a particularly interesting paper that looked at 
one clone of KPC or Klebsiella producing carbapenemase organism that literally was transmitted from an area in Greece throughout Europe. And this has actually defined some of our challenges with this particular organism. In the United States, we have a nice example from Mary Hayden's team where they looked at an outbreak in Chicago. And um, what they found is um, a little bit contrary to what we would think, but 40 of the patients involved in this outbreak, were, of the 40 patients, only four acquired the organism in an acute care hospital, and most were linked to a single long-term care facility. Now, I'd like to sort of argue that we need to think out of the box about this epidemiology, and this is perhaps where we also move away from even infection prevention or we expand what infection prevention means. And so what this cartoon shows is it was a shortcut through the kitchen, the hospital kitchens that, um, that Albert was first approached by a member of antimicrobial resistance. And what is that unexpected epidemiology? Well, um, I find this a fascinating outbreak. Um, this is a foodborne outbreak that was reported in 2011. Um, it occurred in Spain. There were 156 patients that were colonized. 22% were actually infected. And when they went back and did the epidemiology, 35% of the hospital kitchen surfaces or foodstuffs were colonized with the outbreak organism. It was not found in the traditional hospital environment. And in fact, 14% of the food handlers were fecal carriers. The healthcare workers were negative. And so what you can see from this particular um, slide is that once they recognized the source, eliminated the source, they were able to decrease um, the, um, the number of fecal colonizations, which is the bluish line you see whereas the culturing of the patients continued at a significant level. And the Europeans have even um, more interesting data. These, this is ESBL producing Enterobacteriaceae and retail meat. This is a sample from uh, a study from the Netherlands. And out of the 262 fresh meat samples that were tested, 30% were found to contain ESBL producing Enterobacter aceae, and 80% of those samples were chicken. Now, what's most interesting is if you look at this graphic, um, and the chicken meat is represented by yellow. So all of the yellow on this particular slide are, is, are pieces of chicken meat. And what I found most stunning about this is that the green represents rectal colonization in humans, and the blue are blood cultures. So they were actually able to demonstrate that the cultures of, that came from humans were linked um, back to chicken samples that had been identified in retail meats. And they did a second study, and they looked at 98 uh, retail samples, and 94% had ESBL producing isolates, and 39% of them belonged to E. coli genotypes that were also present in human samples. Uh, and now we have, not only with this emerging epidemiology, a new kid on the block, and that is now a more resistant organism that is um, plasmid-mediated, which means it can share this gene across a lot of uh, species. And this is um, uh, resistant to um, colistin, which is one of our last-line antibiotics. And what have we learned about some of these more resistant organisms. Well, the epidemiology actually gets even more interesting. Um, when we looked at, uh, when 
Tim Walsh et al. looked at MDM1 in drinking and pooled water in New Delhi. This is what they found. Um, this study was done in 2010. They looked at seepage, which is really sewage, as well as public water um, around New Delhi. The samples were then sent to the UK. They were tested for the blah MDM1 gene by PCR. And then they also compared the findings with uh, sewage effluent samples from whales um, and um, did some additional experiments that we'll talk about in a minute. Um, so what you can see here is um, the percentage of samples that uh, were <coughs> obtained. Uh, the green represents the seepage or sewage samples. The so red represents water samples that were obtained. And 4% um, of the water samples contained MDM1, or, which is one of the CREs in the water, and 30% of the, the sewage samples did. But probably even more striking is that all of the sewage um, and water samples grew on media that contained cefotaxime. Uh, and, and in fact, 94% of these grew, and 28% of water samples grew on uh, or, um, media that contained meropenem. So these are highly, highly resistant organisms that are in the environment um, where millions of people live. The final um, piece of this that I think is some of the more interesting is they actually looked at the plasmid that carries the MDM1 gene. As I mentioned earlier, these are highly transmissible and you can share, these organisms will share bacteria with anything that, um, that they're in contact with. So as you can imagine in the GI tract, that would be a fertile ground for sharing plasmids. Um, and what's interesting is um, the ideal temperature for plasmid transfer is shown by the blue dotted line that goes across the screen. Uh, <clears throat> and then you can see the mean low and high temperatures in New Delhi. And so between April and October, you have an ideal environmental temperature for sharing of these plasmids. And it may also be important as we start thinking about our interventions to start thinking even about the environment in which um, our, we are caring for patients and how this can be affected. So um, <clears throat> when you start really trying to pull this all together, what can you really sort of say about this? Uh, so I'm going to show you one final um, paper, and this was an ex a quasi-experimental design used to evaluate the impact of antimicrobial interventions um, where they restricted ceftazidine and ceftriaxone um, to interrupt the spread of ESDLs in two hospitals. And this was done over a five-year period. This comes out of, uh, <coughs> of um, Ab Lautenbau's group at Penn. Uh, and what they showed is they were able to significantly decrease their ceftriaxone at hospital A um, and as well as hospital B. So in both of these hospitals, you end up with a significant decrease in the use of the antimicrobial of, of interest. Um, and then they found some risk factors that were associated with being colonized. None of this is going to surprise anyone, whether you were in a long-term care facility or older or had a decubitus ulcer. What's interesting, and the reason I wanted to show this, is what you can see is that here are both of the hospitals that are represented by these different colored bar graphs. Or, um, uh, and then you can sort of see the two your moving average, and you really didn't get at the kind of reduction in resistance that you would want. And in fact, here um, 
you know, shows you that they really were able to decrease the amount of, uh, or increase the amount of cefepime, but there weren't as many decreases in the antibiotic use as would be important. So, to go back to my little cartoon, what I would like to say is, you know, I think it's complicated, uh, but that uh, antimicrobial stewardship and management alone, I don't think is going to solve the problem. Um, that there is a huge role for infection prevention in this. And actually, um, the more and more I watch this, uh, I think that there's going to have to be increased involvement in um, not only sort of the animal husbandry world, but even the environment in which um, we are living. And that will require interventions that are more in the health policy arena than traditionally in the infection prevention arena. Um, so I think the new paradigm is that our potential prevention efforts will include not only everything that we talked about before, but having a decreasing the antimicrobial use in animals, um, horticulture, agriculture, and you may even argue that we need infection prevention in that world. So is the sky falling? No, I don't think it is. And in fact, I think the WHO has come out with a very interesting plan for action uh, for dealing with antimicrobial resistance. And what you see here is that they want to increase awareness. They want to increase surveillance and research. They want to enhance infection prevention. They want to optimize the use of antimicrobials in medicine and human health, and then ensure that we have a sustainable um, environment in which to, to, to roll these strategies out. So in summary, I think that um, antimicrobial resistance and its control is a challenge for the next decade, if not longer. Control measures are complicated and are going to need to include efforts that include infection prevention and stewardship, um, that stewardship needs to move way beyond humans. Um, and probably public policy strategies. Uh, to interrupt transmission and emergence of resistance, it will require culture change, and no, I did not talk about that. And without additional re research, the best and most effective interventions, timing or implementation, are going to be hard for us to um, make any kind of uh, um, estimates of how, how to do, what to do, and when to do it. So I think there's a huge role for environment um, and for research in this arena. So um, I'd like to stop here. I'm happy to entertain any questions. Um, and I hope that I've convinced you that um, we cannot forget infection prevention in a time where we're really focusing a lot on stewardship. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pearl, very much for your stimulating and very thorough webinar. I'd like to remind our participants, if you haven't already, this is your opportunity to connect, to connect with Dr. Pearl and ask your questions, and she'd be happy to respond. Uh, I'd just like to start off with kind of where you ended is how, in the approach of antimicrobial stewardship, I think you've definitely convinced me that there's definitely a role that you need to work almost right along side by side with the infection prevention team. Do you have some recommendations for that? Because I think we have both members listening today, both infection prevention practitioners as well as antimicrobial stewards. How do you recommend that they, they engage? So uh, in, in my, um, you know, and, and again, I, I just need to start off by saying this is a rapidly evolving field. So what we say today may change tomorrow as we get more and more information. But structurally, what I would say is that if you want to synergize your efforts, uh, that the stewardship as well as the infection prevention teams can really be housed in areas that are very close to each other. You need to have that kind of communication. The, 
Stewardship pharmacists get call, gets called about is CRE. Does the infection preventionist know? Do they want the patient isolated? You know, et cetera. So you can facilitate that kind of conversation back and forth. Um, you can also really effectively use resources. You can have joint surveillance strategies that enhance the effectiveness of both programs. Um, you can have uh, programs to do surveillance. I mean, there are many electronic programs out there that will not only identify areas where your, your stewardship activities are important, but also where your infection prevention activities are important. And probably the other area that I think we really can do a better job at is even looking at outbreaks. I mean, traditionally, outbreak investigations are in the, um, the infection prevention group's purview, if you will. But it may be that many of these we should be approaching with not only the traditional infection prevention uh, <clears throat> Uh, uh, sort of interventions, but we should be doing simultaneous um, uh, interventions with with uh, antimicrobial use. So I think that there are, you know, structurally that's important, and I think we can really foster much more communication with these groups if we uh, sort of view them as separate expertises, but where there are a lot of potential shared resources they can be much more effectively leveraged if they're, um, if they're working together. So I don't know if I answered your question. Absolutely. Yeah, and that leads me to a question about your, you're actively involved in many different research projects, and it seems to me that as an antimicrobial stewardship team may be conducting outcomes research, which is now part of the mandate to see are my certain practices or changes that I've implemented now having the effect that I desired, or what kind of outcomes am I seeing? If you forget to include perhaps some of the infection control practices that are happening, or maybe have changed during that time period, that you may miss uh, some sort of factor that could influence your outcome. So it seems to me almost the research strategy should involve both teams. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I think that you, you know, the, whether it's um, whether it's an infection prevention or a stewardship, I mean, it's very clear that uh, these these activities would, in epi talk, I guess we would say that they, they would confound, but they potentially influence the outcome. So, you know, the the new studies that we start looking at, we really do need to control for and understand the infection control as well as the stewardship activities and any changes in those activities so that you can effectively look at um, whatever you're trying to measure in your outcome. Absolutely. Um, okay, and then also I want to switch gears. You talked a lot about surveillance, and another topic that came up in, in your presentation was the role of colonization of some of these multidrug resistant organisms that are colonizing patients, yet they may not be the cause of infection, but yet, but they're bringing them into the hospital with, with whatever disease state they have. So it, to me, it's a little bit of, as the diagnostics tools become more sensitive, we're going to, you're going to obtain a lot more information. And how do you start to, what's the importance of colonization versus an actual infection? I think that's a very good question, and I don't know that I can totally answer it. I can say that um, we all talk about the iceberg effect, where um, what we identify in clinical cultures is really that part of the iceberg that's above water. Um, that could be colonization and infection, but there is probably uh, a large part of the iceberg that is sitting under the water that represents a reservoir, if you will. Uh, and how important that reservoir is may depend on the organism and the setting that we're talking about. Uh, but, you know, colonization and what we call colonization pressure, which is, you know, really how many um, infected uh, or colonized individuals uh, are in a, a given area, 
could certainly impact not only, I mean, transmission because it probably impacts uh, contamination in the environment, contamination of hands, uh, et cetera. So uh, I think that colonization plays a role. Uh, what I would argue is that we probably need to think about colonization a little more broadly than just human colonization. I find that the data that's come out of Europe um, as well as the data on MDM1s from India, very interesting in that it's talking about food colonization as potentially a source, as well as water colonization as a source. Um, so, so I don't know that we totally know the answer, but I think that um, these are questions that need to be better understood. Is you know, what is this role in this long, in this large chain of, of infection and tr and transmission? Do you do you also foresee that, or maybe you're already doing this in your practices where we've already started to screen whether a, a patient would have MRSA prior to surgery, but also because of the prevalence of some of these gram-negative organisms in the environment, people could be bringing, or in the long-term care facility, bringing them into the hospital, will, will we be screening more upon admission for gram-negative organisms and resistance? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Will you be screening more in the future for gram-negative organisms that are being brought into the hospital from long-term care facilities or just from the environment as some of the diagnostic tools become more readily available? Yeah, um, you know, screening is, there's a whole can of worms, and we have sort of gone almost full circle in the past 10 years on screening. Um, so I think the role of screening really depends a little bit on your setting, the prevalence of the organism, and what your goals are. Uh, and I highlight goals. I think it's really important to think about how are you going to use the data and is it going to enhance whatever your intervention is going to be? Um, there are people who are very pro-screening um, and who have uh, programs to screen in high-risk areas, and these have been very successful. It's not clear if it's the screening or if it's the fact that it enhances isolation and some of the other um, strategies that are put in place, decreases um, unnecessary antibiotic use, et cetera. And there are other groups that argue that it really doesn't do that and there isn't a need and it hasn't really decreased the burden of uh, infection. So I think um, we are going to have better tools. Uh, we're going to have to learn how to use them. Um, you know, an example right now that everyone is living through is C. diff, where we, we're we using PCR and we've all seen our C. diff rates have gone up, yet it's not clear to us that it re really reflects an increase in infection, but more more a more sensitive tool that is identifying DNA in a setting where there is an actual infection. So um, there's no right answer to that. It's just... I think it has to be a thoughtful approach. Absolutely, that's very good advice. We, we've we got a participant that would like you to speak a little about, about the total use of colistin present day versus where we were at historically. And if, you know, is that starting to be used more? Is it still restricted? And what are your thoughts on that? So um, I may be the wrong person to ask because I had really never used colistin until about four or five years ago, uh, so I don't have a lot of historical perspective. I certainly don't remember it being used when I was a fellow, so I would argue that um, because I trained at, at large academic centers where we should have been using it, that we probably weren't using it very much, and it had that reputation of being an extremely toxic drug. It's got an associated renal toxicity as well as a, a CNS um, and, and um, otic toxicity that are relatively significant. Um, now, what we are learning is that the risk-benefit has really changed when you start dealing with these highly resistant organisms. And many of us are beginning to see 
people with infections that are resistant to everything we have ever used. And so not only are we using colistin more, and um, the risk-benefit ratio, if you will, has changed because people are dying from these highly resistant organisms, and we will, are more willing to tolerate those side effects. Um, but we're also beginning to use um, combinations of multiple drugs that we would have never used in the past um, to try and treat these um, in sort of a... <clears throat> A kind of desperation mode, if you will. So I do think that um, the risk benefit has really changed our tolerance of some of these more toxic drugs uh, in that we don't have a lot of choices. Correct, that's true. We, we've got a question from some, from I believe probably an infection control practitioner that's in a 100 bed or a little bit greater than 100 bed community hospital and how to create a culture of stewardship w without an ID physician. Well, uh, I think, you know, that that's certainly a very, very tough, um, a tough issue. Uh, and it, it's tough for a number of reasons. I mean, I think that we haven't necessarily um, developed as many ID physicians as we should. And so there's going to be a period of transition where you're not going to have as easy access to those people um, as you would like. Nonetheless, there are a couple of things that are happening that should be able to help. Uh, so first of all, everyone's aware that CMS, um, as well as Joint Commission, are now looking for stewardship programs. Um, and there's nothing like a little regulatory nudge to really help get some resources to start addressing problems. You can invite people in to give lectures, um, have them even spend the day and work with uh, another physician or leader in the hospital who can, um, you know, help drive this. We all work very closely with pharmacists. They become very important partners in trying to create cultures of stewardship. Um, and if that pharmacist with medical support can start with even some of the low-hanging fruit, that can help create the culture. And then the final thing is I personally think there's a huge role for us thinking about telemedicine. Um, Right now, a lot of this, like infection prevention, can really be done, you know, and I think about this more being in Texas by, by just trying to communicate with my colleagues in different ways to help them through this um, until they have more appropriate resources. So I think finding a champion, and it may not be an ID physician, getting them somewhat educated, Bringing in experts and using pharmacists are three kind of easy things to do. Um, and I would leverage the new regulatory uh, standards to help get the resources so that you can do some of that. Thank you. Yes, I think those are all very helpful suggestions. Um, okay, we have a, a final question here. Um, if you had to choose a criteria to risk assess patients for CRE, what criteria would you use? And would you screen these patients or just use precautions? Uh, another loaded question. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I think there are a couple of criteria to consider. I don't know that I can pick one. Uh, you know, a lot of this really, you can use a sort of several epidemiologic clues. A lot of the CRE, at least in North America, is associated with healthcare. And so you can look for people who very much sound like people who had to have MRSA or some of these other resistant organisms. They tend to be, have been in healthcare settings, gotten lots of antibiotics, and have, you know, 
some type of, of illness and severity of illness that, that would suggest that they would get a lot of antibiotics. So those are sort of the traditional things we think about. What is not traditional about CRE um, is that clearly some of the some of these are associated with travel. And so I think we have to really start thinking about, you know, medical tourism and travel to other areas as potential um, risk factors that you need to consider. Now, I just can, what I've said maybe works in most of the U.S., um, but certainly in some localities, uh, you may know of um, certain facilities that have a very high prevalence of the organism. That may be an appropriate criteria to, to use. Um, and in, cert in certain part of the world, uh, you know, for example, India, we know that a lot of those people are colonized with CRE just because of what I showed you, what's in the water. And, um, you know, so in some cases, some of those uh, <clears throat> is some, you know, people from those areas you may want to consider at, at high risk. Um, now, would I screen or just use precautions? It totally depends on the setting. Um, if I was evaluating somebody from a, um, Asia for a liver transplant in clinic, I would probably screen that person um, and because I wouldn't want them to go into a liver transplant, et cetera, not knowing uh, what they may or may not be colonized for. And it may actually alter some of the, the recommendations that we would make. Um, if I were admitting people to an intensive care unit, um, again, it would depend a little bit on the resources that are available. Uh, you know, if you're at, working at a large institution that's a safety net hospital where um, the <clears throat> screening may be, you know, relatively expensive and the laboratory is unable to, to support that, you may not want to do that and you may want to go ahead with precautions. Um, in the setting of an outbreak, I would probably do both. So I think it really depends on how you're using it, what the setting is, what the epidemiology and the local epidemiology of the organism are. But I do think there's some epidemiologic clues you can use to um, decide what, you, what would be the best strategy for your locale and your situation. Well, thank you for that thorough answer. I think that provides a lot of information to our listeners. Well, with that, we're out of time. So I'm going to have to conclude today's uh, webinar, which I will remind people is recorded. So if you'd like to share with uh, your colleagues or re-listen to this very interesting webinar at a later time, please feel free to do so. It will be available on our antimicrobial stewardship website. And we would also like to thank Dr. Pearl for her time and all of her insights, and also you listeners for participating in today's program. We really appreciate your support. Thank you, Dr. Pearl. Thank you. Have a nice day, everyone. <laughs>